Well, hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 67th Radical Poetry Reading. I'm Nick Bennett, the Special Projects Editor here at The Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a poetry reading featuring Susan Briante, John Latta, Mary Jo Bang, Maria Grazia Calandrone, all lovingly curated by our guest of honor, Luigi Ballerini. Just a few quick notes before we get started. The Brooklyn Rail acknowledges that Black Lives Matter and that here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We encourage you all to check the chat for a living document of resources and actions that we'll be posting in the chat in just a moment. Um, but without further ado, it is my honor to pass the microphone over to the curator of today's reading, Luigi Ballerini. So Luigi, over to you. Thank you, Nick, very, very much. And thank you, Fong. Thank you, all the people at the Brooklyn Rail. And thank you all, these friends, for having accepted the invitation to be here today. I'm going to read a few notes, OK? So when invited to host this issue of radical poetry, the first thing I did was to check the etymology of radical, uh, which I suspected came from the Latin radix, uh, that is to say, root. Uh, it did. Uh, how now the, fu the function of roots uh, is to absorb nutrition from the soil. The stronger the roots, the healthier the plant. And so out of metaphor, let's poetry absorb energy from language by listening to its ways, to, by listening to it in ways that no consequential, exploitative, capitalistic, either or logic can vilify or worse still, annihilate it. The logic of poetry. It has been a while since we have deserted the idea of separating the rational from the irrational. And yet emotions which are nothing but the springboard for the writing of a poem have all too often been viewed as the subject matter itself, the object to be captured. This in turn implies a request on readers to engage in sharing or feelings with the author, which often, often goes unheeded. How much more exciting if readers were shown how to accept the invitation to see and hear above all the words and the construct and the imagery caused by those emotions that ended up on the page and use them as their own springboard. 2022 marks the 100th anniversary of the wasteland. Let us take this opportunity to remind ourselves that April may be the cruelest month, but it breeds lilacs out of the deadland, mixing memory and desire, stirring dull roots with spring rain. The poets I've invited to read are stylistically very different but they all share, in my view, the memory and the desire to reach through poetry, the truth of stirring. The stirring that Eliot hinted at, stirring is a kind of truth you cannot demonstrate and that at the same time, you cannot deny. I first approached Maria Grazia Calandrone, Mary Jo Bang, John Lata, and Susan Brianti as an editor and or as a translator from Italian to English and from English into Italian. In doing so, some of my own roots may have ended up intertwining with theirs, or at least I hope so. And now I'd like to invite the very first reader, Maria Grazia Calandrone. Uh, that of Maria Grazia is a very well-known name in the world of contemporary Italian poetry and fiction writing. A good selection of her verse has been included in the second volume of the bilingual anthology, Those Who From Afar Look Like Flies, forthcoming from the University of Toronto Press and covering the second half of the second half of the 20th century. Historical events and personal experience are points of departure for her poetic reflections which are aimed at sensing the joy of being materially part of the universe. In this perspective, her language 
shifts from the collective to private utterances, but the private is carefully chosen and visited only when it can be assumed as a manifestation of a community. Calandrone has brought poetic literacy to a number of educational institutions and even to penal and correctional institutions, training readers to appreciate the logic and to make poetry downright is, there her, is her view a political act, and in our term, a radical act. She will start her reading today with a poem that is also a statement on poetics. She will go first in Italian, I will read the translation, then she will go on on her own in both Italian and English. I try. <laughs> That's, yeah. Now, if I find the translation, that would be great. <laughs> thank you. Thank you to all. Thank you, Luigi, for the invitation. Um, I'll read a uh, um, few lines in Italian, and uh, I, you, you are so kind to read the, in English. And after I try, <laughs> I try, I don't know, uh, to read the, my own the poems. Uh, the first poem is uh, Intelletto d'amore about poetry. La poesia è anarchica, risponde a leggi solo proprie, non può e non deve piegarsi a nient'altro che a se stessa. La sua legge interiore è ritmo, musica assoluta. Questo spiega la commozione che proviamo nell'ascoltare letture di poesia in lingue a noi sconosciute. E, please, Luigi. I... Perhaps poetry, yeah. I'm sorry, poetry is anarchic. It follows only its own laws. It cannot and must not bend to anything except itself. Its inner law is rhythm, pure and simple music. That explains why we can be moved by poetry. We hear read in languages we do not know. We almost feel that we understand even without grasping the words because our molecules ring in consonance with the deep music of poetry, which is the same in every language. Ultrasound, white noise, an invisible language, a nuclear hum translatable by approximation, a sound that resonates with the deepest and most alien part of our molecules and with the primal rumbling of the matter that makes up the chair we are sitting on. Just as certain music, Ludwig van Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata comes to mind, is a literally universal language. Poets have written this forever, but recent discoveries in astrophysics confirm it with scientific rigor, not just intuition. Our deepest core is composed of the same stuff as the stars. According to Margarita Hack, all the matter we are made of was built by stars. All the supernovas, all the elements from hydrogen to uranium were formed in nuclear reactions that take place in supernovas when stars much bigger than the sun explode at the end of their lives and scatter into space. The products of all the nuclear reactions that have taken place within them, very recent discoveries also tell us that half the atoms making up our bodies are matter formed outside the Milky Way, coming from distance impossible to measure. The vibrations of our molecules comes into material resonance with the vibration of the universe, far beyond the universe we know. This force, that moves the sun and other stars is what Dante calls love. Poetry tunes into the deep uninterrupted chorus of this force, pitching its voice in the rumbling of extragalactic stars and to the primal rumbling of the matter that makes up the chair we are sitting on. It's an object made of words of love alone that is plenty. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> now I try. Possible. Put a hand here 
like a white blindfold, close my eyes, feel the threshold with blessing once you have passed through the green gold of the iris like a queen bee and, and the straw upon straw of gold and traced wet, you have made me your honeycomb of light. A constellation of bees swarms on the linden with the inhuman wisdom, well wind of intelligences doesn't live, they own it tree. It will be reductive to call out this necessity of nature. While an anterior void heals between flower and flower, leaving no trace, use your mouth, pull from my heart the golden stinger, memory of a flash that seared my human form in some prehistory, where the mad, mad caress stones like they were children's heads, come closer like the first among lost things and that face rises from stone to smile again. The second, how do you say love in your languages? Languages have no borders. Borders are only political. There is an invisible language that we all can access. All writing is the translation of a word. I traverse the languages I know, searching for the universal language. This is the real avant-garde, the real prophecy for the future of our species. Fekri, Ubun, Dashuri, Sirel, Balabas, Agapi, Utando, Ai, Jeklai, Suyu, Obikam, Maroa, Dubov, Kike Matar, Kartai, Karyad, Dupendo, Amur, Isbrae, Senam, Machabat, Serelem, Rudo, Adaraya, Fitiavana, Libe, Evin, Mikvar. In lines regular and clear, continue the sound, fresh as the word people speak from forest and field, igloo, cabin, and hat on steels, skyscraper and canoe. I, this nothing, fallen into the dream of matter, I will take care of you until the end of the world. The last one for my mother. It shines life, shines like life. At times, it shines peacefully, like your body given over to sleep. At times, it flashes like the glow of a smile, but the earth doesn't shine, ashes doesn't shine. It's true, mother, we don't know anything and we are nothing but bodies and we aren't anywhere anymore afterwards, probably. And this precipice of words is no good for remaking even a molecule of your smile. It was alive, your body, and I saw it as once is a house illuminated by the sunset and the hillside were walking on. I hurried to catch up to you at the end, but you were life serving, life devoted, and the life I was made to let go. Goodbye, mother. Goodbye, professoress. Without defenses, you return as a life that shines. Without defenses, you shine like life, life forsaken, the life of everyone, life that returns to everyone. Thank you to all. Very, very much. We are, I suppose, yes, we're moving along. Uh, and my next uh, guest is Mary, am I correct? Is Mary Jo, right? Mary Jo. The name of Mary Jo Banks name, uh, the name of Mary Jo Banks 
appeared on my horizon as that of a translator of Dante's Divine Comedy first. In North America, translating Dante has a long tradition. It all began with Longfellow and the Harvard Brahmins. Most of those who have tried their hands at it have done so philologically. But as Pound warned somewhere in one of his cantos, philologists obscure the text. Not philology, mind you, but philologists. Well, Mary Jo is a philologist who does not obscure Dante's text. She simply navigates in a world of reference, re referential reality that in her view are apt to replace for the modern reader, those that Dante had chosen for his own immediate audience. So you shouldn't be surprised if at the bottom of uh, the Mount of Purgatory, instead of a medieval songster, you encounter the uh, Iron Maiden. But uh, that's precisely what she's aiming at, making it contemporary and making it possible for people who are not theologically involved with Dante's uh, world to still appreciate his poetry. Now, today she will read from her poetry. Let me steal a few words, Marjorie Pearl of blurbed for Mary Jo's Louise in Love as follows. She says, Louise, is, Louise in Love, Louise is a brilliant poetic creation. The poem that charred her career, in the actor's career in all vicissitudes are delicious language games. Well, these games are not merely playful. They collect and redistribute the necessary energy to retain the narrative mode while disturbing the narration. In a perennial beyonding of what merely appears to be the case, let's not forget that 2022 marks also the 100th anniversary of Wittgenstein's Tractatus, which begins exactly with the words of that which is the case. Mary Jo, mic is yours. You have to unmute yourself. One yes. more to learn. <laughs> Thank you, Luigi, for that, for um, the introduction and for inviting me to be a part of this event. And thank um, also thanks to um, Nick Bennett and for hosting us and Fong and everybody at the Brooklyn Rail. And um, I'm very happy to be here and to be reading a few poems. So these are poems in an yet unpublished manuscript um, that will be called um, a film in which I play everyone. So the first um, poem is called Green Earth. The crush beneath your feet, green grass, the you are here locator, your eyes close, you shake your head and think the sea was once everything we needed. Bowie singing, do you like girls or boys? Bowie saying, I'll finance the film version in which I'll play everybody. The siren gets twinned in the violence of a scene that refuses to end. This is the world is a statement. This so is a day will meet the splintered ends of what went before it. The inhumanity, the rottenness, Night rolls in to stand watch, to see if we find our way. This on a rock moving through air, a century ticking away. This next poem, the title is taken from a poem by Gerard Manley Hopkins. And that poem is called, um, Spelt from Sybil's Leaves. And this is just a, a phrase from it. Our evening is over us. It's the trading in of the workday categories, hours, clouds that linger inside plate glass, corner windows, a man's head blocking the view, 
to become instead a faint future caption at the bottom of a photo of hibiscus. There is no getting around the fact that each of us is a world of our own, an entity, a pageant of one. Just like you, I feel my way forward, letting the back of my hand brush against the matte wall as I watch the chiaroscuro movie of my mind. There should be no anxiety in knowing the world will die when we die. This is how it is with us. The real is wherever we are. The days refuse to stay put. Speaking is a way of living with the ruin we were given. The key, you have to go back to being immature, a time <clears throat> regression essential to running up a further lifetime of debt. I owe you, the polar bear says, an icy French we, oui, a kiss on both cheeks, plus a wish to sit on a bench at the center of a green painted park, your legs planted, the unique sensory effect of the mind holding onto itself while steadying the sky in order to sustain the injury and the after effects of the earthquake, the cutoff that occurs against your will, where you have to turn off in order to engage with the light that comes in to announce the day's breathing and being in a complicated network made of a mesh that allows everything to fall through. This goes on throughout the day and night where you dream of being better than you ever imagined. A surgeon holding a freehand scalpel, the cut the metal makes closes on its own and afterward, everyone walks away well. And um, this is called some identical twin sister, one step ahead. The day shimmers with silver bouncing off the surface of a pond-sized July. Some identical twin sister, one step ahead, looking back without stopping. Can time keep capturing an animal even after it's turned itself in? Cell block of an instant, mugshot of an afternoon fawn, a disappearance at the border of a forest, a bed of narrow gauge needles, a sparkling pool at the park's edge, a botanical garden defined by the never ending echo of a deco clock, the ornamental myth of floral love carried over moment by moment, repeating ad infinitum. You point to something, the doll in the side yard, her plastic teeth perfect in moonlight. You open your mouth to let the hush in. You and she dressed alike in visible luminous blue. When asked, you'll make manifest your ideal smile, your adaptable funhouse face. Punishment will find you when a fever fractures into pieces, the durable rod of your long standing spine. A coat slips from your shoulders in its pocket the magical half tab you're waiting to take. Rambo to Verlaine in ink in a folded letter. You have to be a seer to see. What you really want is to be a camera documenting the height you're about to fall from. I'm going to have a drink of water. Am I? I muted myself, yes. Okay, I managed to do that. Thank you very much, Mary Jo. And uh, since we are moving along just fine, I think I'll turn over to John Latta. Uh, I have these words of introduction. I hope he likes them. And I start with a quote from one of his own poems, a syllabary of, nose, of noise tending to white. Behemoth gleeps and suzurus the French word for key. Out of the din, a tonality emerges, a series of probabilities. We stake high stakes to betting the tempo itself, betting that tempo itself points to recognition. 
I cannot say that in these lines, I should find a clue for the gradual understanding of John Latta's poetry, but I must admit that they are what persuaded me and his translator Gianluca Rizzo to include Latta in the anthology Chicago e le città della prateria and the prairie towns published a couple of years ago by Aragno in Turin. It also features poems by Mary Jo Bag, by the way. The underlying principle of the anthology was the notion that the frontier, notion of the frontier, a line to be crossed to seek the unknown that lies on the other side, a timeless human temptation. Latta's poetry seemed to embody this temptation and at the same time make tangible the pleasure of walking along the mysterious tightrope which where sound and rhythm obtain on an equal if not superior footing as codified acts or shocks of recognition. There's of course much more than meets the ear in Latta's poetry, but that must be left to another occasion. John. Thank you, Luigi. Uh, that was that was uh, lovely, and uh, I'm going to uh, read uh, first a couple of things from a book called Breeze, uh, published in oh I don't know almost twenty years ago now. But uh, this is in the margins of a book by Heidegger. Uh, a sort of outright lie, really. Uh, I never wrote it in the margins of any book. I wrote it on a yellow legal pad. But uh, daily chores impinge, poking little subsets of clarity into the unutterable stink of thinking, just as a philodendron flexing furls its tame blue fingers around a newel post or a door jam and is given to support and temper the wild both. And somewhere a man keeps glancing at a watch, angry with an unidentifiable lateness ticked off in minutes, so that he misses the minute particulars of a mockingbird's singular loud triads. He would rather not be out this morning waiting for the bus that'll transport him hatted and usual to the job he hates. The French triumvirate of Metro, Boulot, Dodo breaks like a succession, succession of tiny suns rising over a glorious day, already too full of nouns, too full of nouns that work to congeal the beckoning stillness that, once in motion, moves him into enchantment and endless conversation, that ongoing effortless grant to return to whatever is arriving. In the last year I spent uh, writing uh, a series of 12 poems, one for each month, uh, based on daily uh, notes, basically, uh, tiny, tiny fragments. Uh, and they're, they're each too long to read. So but I, I, I was looking through this book and, and uh, noticed that that this poem is sort of a precursor to it. This is called North Carolina Notebook. It's a similar kind of, uh, but much shorter. The road to the pier collapses under the slow brunt of relict dune deposits, blown. The mystery of the line of cormorants perched on pilings, black wings shrugged out still one hour's tenuous purchase on the day, unspent. Rapturous bob and drill of sanderlings and turnstones, ruddy individual schooling, the gem stuck skirt of ocean. Prickly pear and sheep sorrel snarling up traffic in the lower kingdoms of dune grass. Sky gone to brooding, particle heavy at dusk, knits itself to woolly acres of spume. 
a lone laughing gull, black head turning like a knob, beats mercy back by crying, mercy, mercy, up through the slipstream of wind trying to go around wind. Dwarf pines dotting the sinkholes, hummocky nether regions. Lumps of human color, salt stung, hallooing without sound, dashing pitiably at waves, in waves. This is a, a prose poem that sort of falls apart into lineated verse at the end. Uh, it's called Garden Variety Stories. I championed narrative for a number of sluggish years, then decided against its way of spotlighting the social when my habits became increasingly those of a hermit saint, puttering about in downpours, tending my sensational potatoes. So a story begins, or might, with a voice swoop, swooping down out of the logical north to ransack your monastic neural fortress, heaping with barbaric glee cadences unidentifiable and plotted on what you have grown to consider your own little patch of earth. You have never charted it very carefully over the years, never made diagrams of the rotations of radishes and peas or any of the more unusual crops you have sometimes strewn about in your laughably impertinent manner. Your interest is just not in the jut of the jaw of the man who is always tightening a bolt on a weed whacker or in the way that man's tongue always finds itself stuck half out, clamped between his teeth like a stogie whenever he's got a chore to do. Your way is not to view the vegetable kingdom as a temporary transcendent hollow or as a way of leaving this world with its rainy interruptions aside and route to the sober triumphs of the beyond. Your way is to participate in the ongoing loud transformation. And if hailstones the size of small cabbages hurtle out of the changeable sky one day, wiping out the cabbages, you were not put on this earth just to grow. Remember that loss is its own indemnity. And this story, like light, is not anything you'll ever be able to hold in your hands. Uh, I wrote a number of, uh, of, word, of poems that were five words per line, 16 lines each that uh, I, I, I got stuck with this form and, and I, I wrote about 150 of these things. And, and they, they were arranged in alphabetical groups and I, I put them together in a book called Some Alphabets, which nobody has ever seemed to want to publish, but uh, there's a couple of those. Uh, this is called Daunting. A daunting map is all we got, smudgy inked in green relief. It lends airs of disbelief to our fevered marginal lot. Books we read are the sort antiquarians recommend, the frenzy of a zealot's end, the history of a social obligation, sexual exercise for sport. Out the tent flap door, one sees the piercing blued stretch of a lake obtrude. An envoy reports, the way is mere wavering, unmarked and apt to sully souls used to hours of senseless hammering. This is called Zone. Uh, it's kind of a, a baby brother to uh, Apollinaire's great Zone uh, with the same title. That final lassitude, O oh shepherdess, fed up with Greek antiquity, drowsy and remiss. The ample sky fills up with thousands of soot daubed swifts, circumnavigating fiery motes smokestacks. To God, to God, the chittering goes. Hungry men bang incinerators, incinerators open one by one. What falsehood is in marriage means the sign is hanging off the door. 
so the dare, the haught his own, the unpresuming shrug, so the immense defiant pity for what one cannot say. Moon is not moon, moon is sawn bone. Uh, this is called My Voice. This is going back to all the conversations about finding one's voice that seem to have gone on. It is not what is commonly known. This sad digression hath no reason for it. Call it an occasional, excuse me, call it an occasion of solitary impermeability, annunciamentos of relumed portmanteau excrescency. No, don't. It is not a simple deviation into novelties which guide sad thoughts, though gallantry may mar its hinderer. It is not perseverance codified, a jumble we and fitly took to. I do not permit it to be a limited pleasure of one sense, like a horse or a pitiless donkey disquieted by a fiery pyre or stuck pointlessly with a goad. Thank you so much, John. And uh, we come to the next to the last, I guess. If I, I, Luigi, I, I'm so sorry to interrupt, if I may. Um, but I, I have the feeling, I think Mary Jo had more to read. And I'm curious if we could possibly pass the mic back to her before we go on to Susan. Yeah, I had actually put in the same request. Oh, also okay. Because I'd like Maria Grazia to read that poem to a mother in Italian. So let's go back. Okay. So shall we have Maria read and stay in the order or? It's okay, let's, let's, why don't you read first Mary Jo and then, and then Maria Grazia. Okay. So um, this poem is called A Film in Which I Play Everyone. In scene two, silence is a sleeve. I'm an arm in it. In an outdated Hollywood magazine, I found a photo of someone wearing my hair. How can that be? Now I can't stay, stop thinking about the synaptic sparks over which no one has any control, or they have some control, but not enough to count on in a crisis. I'm making sense all the time of all the senseless endings. A day is as long as the time it takes for the mind to consider life and death countless times, which must make a day plus a night a highway we're only vaguely aware of since we're busy sitting in a chair or lying on a bed with a floral print bedspread or walking to the store past someone with a dog on a leash and a phone in their hand into which they seem to be saying, that is not what I meant, blah, 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 to an absent ear. Home, you unpack the items you bought, crease the bags flat, stack them out of sight, all without saying a word. This is a non-speaking part. You're an extra. The day you were filmed on the steps, walking into the school dance, the costume you wore was pure you. The set for the scene where everyone disappears was painted Parisian sky blue. The air burned like a curtain on fire, where the fire kept going out, then gets relit, a trick candle on a cake made of clouds. And um, there are two more poems, and um, these poems I've just written, um, and they're ekphrastic poems based on paintings of the Virgin Mary. Occasionally, people who don't know me um, on email send me emails, Dear Mary, and I keep writing back, all best, Mary Jo, but they persist in calling me Mary, and I have to finally tell them that I'm not immaculate and that um, I'm Mary Jo. So I started playing with that idea of, of who Mary was. So this is after Botticelli's The Annunciation, the title of the poem, The Announcement. They say the power has to be activated by a specialist. That's what they say, the power. 
A bird came to see me once, a talking magpie that said, this will happen. And I didn't so much agree as think, why me? No reason. For those who would deify me, I say, don't. This is ordinary, being at hand and being asked to do whatever needs doing and enduring, being for as long as rain falls on the world, a tattoo that can't be washed off, a castle that isn't mine reminds me that this was not my idea, especially if you consider how inevitable death is, the way it falls like a cascading drape from the waist to the floor, the softness playing the role of a door that works hard to keep the world out and the rabbit mind behind it quiet. and the last poem, Immaculate. And this is after um, El Greco's The Immaculate Conception. Immaculate. I didn't imagine it would be like this. Day, a thread that turns into ink at night and sinks in an ocean of inverted brain waves. Someday I'll no longer be having thoughts, which is fine with me. No more failure, no more humiliations of the flesh. Last night I dreamed I lost my shoes, but got on a bus. When I was too far gone to go back, I got off. The driver drove away. That was that, I said to the tree standing next to me. I guess I'm lost. Then a child arrived wearing a ghost costume. Then another, this one dressed as a dove. A feathered cape hugged its shoulders and climbed up the nape, making it seem as if it were part child and part bird. That one was crying and stopping, then crying again. Every time it cried, a halo of baby faces framed a light right where my lost mind kept staring at air. Thank you. Can we ask Maria Grazia then to read the, poi leggere la poesia? In italiano della quella della mamma la mamma sì yeah. I, I, yes i can splende la vita splende come vita a volte splende quieta come tuo corpo abbandonato al sonno, a volte sfolgora come il lampo del sorriso, ma la terra non spende. Davvero mamma, non sappiamo niente. Siamo che corpo, non siamo più in nessun luogo dopo, probabilmente. Era vivo il tuo corpo, e lo guardavo. Come si guarda la casa tornando, faticavo a raggiungerti alla fine. Ma eri vita accessibile, vita dovuta e vita che ho dovuto lasciare andare. Addio, mamma, addio, professoressa. Senza difese torni vita che splende. Senza difese splendi come vita, vita abbandonata, vita di tutti, vita che torna a tutti. Grazie, thank you very, very much. All right, now I think I'll go to Susan Briante. And uh, this is what I, I wrote. Uh, what strikes me most in Susan's poetry is the courage to take on issues that are not normally dealt in poetry. First among them, the issue of money and financial activities. She does not talk poetically about them. She talks them into poetry. This is miles away from the Poundian instigation to approach such issues while retaining in poetry the language of economics. This means taking a stance, the only stance in fact, that will return poetry to a position of preeminence and relevance. Like anything else, history and economic history in particular, must be written in text that being made of words are subject to the whims and the temptations of their roaming nature, far from the syllogistic straitjacket. 
Peter may be a man, as such, he would be immortal. But what kind of knowledge will this deductive and inductive procedure give us of the how, when, why, where, etc., of his passing? The same applies to the stock exchange. We have to learn not to fall prey of the language invented to sustain its machinations. Susan's poetry can help. Thank you. Okay, yours. Thank you so much, Luigi. Everyone can hear me, yes? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Luigi. Um, thank you, Maria Grazia, Mary Jo, John. I can't, my face hurts from smiling so much. Um, <laughs> I feel kind of silly, but it's, it's just a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Nick, and thank you, Fo, and thank you, everyone at the Brooklyn Rail for hosting us. I'm going to read um, four poems. Two are quite new, and um, two are, are not so new, but they just haven't found their way into books yet. And the, the last poem I'll read, um, I think will most directly um, connect with my thinking and writing about economics that Luigi mentioned in his introduction. Um, the first poem I'll read is called Striding Walking. To open the body is to turn like Orpheus and lose everything. When working with the 35 millimeter camera, you trust the film advance. You feel the long gap between moment and document felt almost nowhere else now. A child learns the calendar on a spool of paper with pictures to mark the day she swims or eats pizza, but the body registers how the season withdraws from her. Leaf by leaf, this tinned out autumn light refuses us like mountains at certain elevations or an economic system. An old woman sits at a table with a white sheep draped over her head. In the dream, I know she is dead and I wake to the sound of a street cleaner. In workshop, I tell my students to let the steams show. We talk about limits and failure, productive confusion. In life, I'm afraid. Today, the physicists say we might be living in a brain around the event horizon of a collapsed hyperdimensional star. The physicists say higher reality, say soon after the beginning of time. Every house cradles its dead. In ours, men pull up carpet and asbestos. Fine fibers spindle in the lungs, a persistent melody a poetics of Monsanto that commodifies the seed. How do we feed our deaths enough to live proximate? A mirror above the head, a water strider against some surface tension of breath. Sometimes the dead come to me in dreams. We finish conversations. They hand me objects. Sometimes they cannot speak, their mouths full of cotton. Perhaps my mind is a dark room for some chemical reaction of memory and desire. Perhaps the dead trace their stories on whatever wall they can. To lose the body is to sail like Odysseus, is to wait like Edwin, Edward Snowden for a country. If we traveled far enough, we could find a thousand children waiting on the border. They were walking toward us. blind curve. Took a series of self-portraits on the bed, one hand over my right eye, then left, as if to mimic another's gaze. What were you looking for, Fareed asked. On the couch, we flipped through photographs of male couples, 1840 through 1918, reading for intimacy, a hand resting on a thigh, cheek on a shirt front, love or sex. The tilt of a chin shows nothing. A friend learns his lover has HIV. Death is everywhere, he tells me in his generation. An epidemic breaks. A highball glass slips from a hand at the bar. Some men seek it, he tells me, giving in to a desire to shift the frame 
expose themselves to a higher power, some wheel of star, some splinter of constellation. My first apartment in Austin perched on a hill at the edge of a blind curve. I'd wake nights to a shattering of headlight, resettling of metal against pavement, tides of windshield through the intersection. The driver squints, freezes, stoplight, telephone pole, moon, curb. The last time I saw my friend, he took our photograph in a parking lot after a warehouse exhibition. Gaze makes a kind of touch. Death was everywhere that year in all the prize-winning books and Broadway plays. Once a car skidded into my backyard, another somersaulted through the crosswalk. Once a driver sat on the road smoking a cigarette next to his wreck. Once the EMTs pulled a sheet over a body in the street and the whole night went mute. Our views multiply as well as what we cannot see. My foot tucked into Farid's pants cuff, just out of frame. What moves me? I switch the hand over my eye and the room shifts. A slide drops in a carousel that wheels like a galaxy under which, under which we swerve, we shard, we accelerate, we fuck and break, my God, just to be seen. with a view to the black walnut tree. My daughter throws up once or twice a day, opening mouth and hands as if to pour out what was clenched, throws up pillows, backpacks and refrigerators, builds a version of our cat from pretend vomit, builds a version of our kitchen. I worry, I can't soothe her fears, it's terrible to witness a body undo itself. Reading through a pamphlet when my mother entered hospice, I realized I knew as little about death as I once did about birth. Never heard the story of my own, my mother in twilight. When pregnant, I watched video after video my doula showed me, all pant and fluid and scream. Once in Dallas, I witnessed workmen knock down a wall of our house with a view to the shivering leaves of our black walnut tree from my seat at the breakfast table, I could not believe how easily inside became out. It's terrible to wonder how a body undoes itself, to guess what happened to my father after retching in an emergency room, who came first to help him, what was the last thing he saw. My daughter is terrified of throwing up, panics whenever her stomach aches, what will never be taken from us? My father died on a hospital gurney with a please resuscitate order still hanging on his refrigerator. How can I turn away from his death or my daughter, an order unread, a breath not taken? There's no consolation, just my child's empty hands that she pretends to fill but whatever, with whatever she imagines royals inside of her. And I'll, I'll finish with this poem, 13 Questions for the Next Economy. On the side of the road, white cardboard in the shape of a man, illegible script, a signpost with scrawl, will pay cash for diabetes strips. A system under the system with its black box. Disability, hearing, a billboard reads. Trouble with social security, where does the riot begin? Spark of dry grass, Russian thistle in flames or butterflies bobbing as if pulled by unseen strings through the alleyway. My mother's riot would have been peace. A bicycle wheel chained to a concrete planter. What metaphor can I use to describe the children sleeping in cages in detention centers? Birds pushed sense word by a breeze, a train of brake lights extending. Mesquite pods mill under our feet on a rainless sidewalk. What revolution will my daughter feed? A break the state, twig quick snap, 
or a long divining as if for water, a cotton silence, a death. Who will read this in the next economy, the one that comes after, the one that kills us? What lessons will we take from the side of the road, a wooden crucifix, a white bicycle, a pinwheel, a poem waiting to be redacted? Which would you cross out? Thank you. Thank you so, so much, Susan. Thank um, you very much. Thank you, Maria Grazia, Susan, Mary Jo, and John. Um, if I may come back in, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very honored to now introduce the curator of today's uh, reading. And uh, just a few lines to introduce Luigi. I want to do as, as well as you did for every other poet, apologies, but uh, <laughs> we're beginning. But here, here it goes. Award-winning poet, essayist, translator, and curator, Luigi Ballerini lives in New York and Milano. He has published numerous books of poetry with recent titles such as Se il tempo e matto from Mandadori 2010, Una dozzina di scherzi più tre from Montanari 2012, and Appelle filo da polo from Cento amici del libro 2016. And of course, Last but not least, Cephalonia have published in 2016 from the Rail's own imprint, Rail Editions. Um, it is my great honor to um, pass the mic back to you, Luigi. Thank you very much. So I think I will read a couple of uh, segments from Cephalonia. For those of you who do not know, Cephalonia is an island in the Ionian Sea where a major tragedy occurred in 1943. Namely, a whole division of Italian soldiers were slaughtered by the Air Force, the German, the Nazi uh, German Air Force. And uh, uh, I imagined uh, what happened uh, nowadays, of course, talking about that is like talking about Genghis Khan. I mean, nobody remembers what happened in 19... Uh, 95, imagine 1943. So uh, I imagine that the only way we could possibly make sense out of it was to try to have two members of that tragedy, a German uh, industrialist and an Italian soldier who died there, to talk about it and see if by any chance they squeeze out of this absurd event some universal truth that might benefit generations to go. So the very first, uh, the poem is a dialogue between two individuals. Uh, the, the very first one uh, opens the poem with this. Uh, There's not a shred of doubt that I am dead. There's some debate as to how it happened. Fallen according to all reports in open combat after days of delayed attacks, some nasty rumor ran, they put me up against the wall. Uncertainty could not but shake one who had fashioned my silence into a sort of reason by means of sarcasm or surges of unsuppressible wrath. My absence aroused expectations I would have been proud to avoid. Struggling to be counted with the living I stirred up unsuspected, but not illicit whiffs of truth. That bad faith, to name one, is better noticed when an intermittent loathing succumbs to the flatteries of a god masseur, or when it does not croak like frogs, nor screams when to the right you hear a trumpet blast answered by a blast on the left. Awareness of a masked existence unfolds unsuspected symptoms of clairvoyance and paroxysm. To be in it, to stay with it, singing to feel better, to understand who, without guilt, asked for and paid the bill, who dumped the ballast, dead or alive, it is as living we retrace the steps of our crime and return to it, anxiously feigning death. This is the German industrialist, uh, another section of the poem. 
I'm not one who stays up nights and claims that the face of Jack Balance proves there were good men even among the Nazis. And even now there are sumptuously frescoed with suspenders and Luger in hand. But I do maintain that to add I'm proud of it to I don't give a damn and let foreigners know who we really are, you need not have the advantage of a coherent foresight. Quite enough the conviction was stifled once and for all the temptation of upmanship. Who would dare call Zeitgeist the peach blossom a little woman sells at the crossroad while it rains and pours among bitter gusts of wind? Even if some child of yours had not eaten my unleavened bread, this left afloat philology would not spare him the dangers of a fugitive apotheosis. The melancholy wish to bring about social change comes from observing those who with cyclic nonchalance repent mistakes, illustrating the relentless bold rhythm of their own emancipation. Queen of Hearts is different from Queen Premature, from the high prices that cannot and will not endure, part by nature, from that I disdain and love, from which I care with care, and I must forbear. The, uh, if I have time for one more piece, I'll go to the end of the poem, which ends with a chorus, proving that uh, the only real issue that remains out of the tragedy is the fact that no one knows what returning means. Uh, there is no return, uh, despite the fact that we've grown up uh, with the Ulysses myth of going back home and finding a wife, children, and killing off the enemies, etc. But even Ulysses has to go away again after he has accomplished all that, as Homer makes clear. So here there's one little piece uh, uh, of the poem, which is as the beat of a Latin examiner, except that it's not in Latin, it's in Italian and therefore in English at this point. But the beat is such that provokes a question, do you speak Latin? He who crafts his life and crafts it as a game of returns must take part in every breakaway and end up with a full of flies. He who in denial dismayed by his own son transfers expectations from father to son can feign to be a male slain in a field of stubble. He who spends his life returning and finds delight in the yearning of not returning, his life is the same as passing from exasperated sense to sounds inducing laughter. Will it do for laughter to hide the gap that leads to a game of roles, to the hassle of holding back? As I'm made of rubber, when I play, I play goalie, where even paranoids can feel rightfully threatened. In the impassibly dry lake bed of the sign, where threats grow thicker, the more they unravel. The Duce is always right, always the German wrong. Latina loquitur. Do you speak Latin? At the end, uh, in Italy, it bay. Big Latin. At the end of the day, I get by, but clearly there's no cure against things acquired in retreat. That's the end of, of the poem, and maybe we can call the end of the meeting also. Okay. I don't know. Thank you. It's up to you, Nick. If we have if you have a few words to wrap it up. Um, I do. I I just, I, I want to thank you all so much for this beautiful reading today, for this um, beautiful start to 2022, and for noting what this year marks uh, in, in, in poetry and beyond. So thank you, Luigi. Thank you, 
Maria Grazia, Susan, Mary Jo, and John. This has been a deep pleasure. Um, I do want to share that um, we, sorry, just a second. <laughs> um, we encourage everyone to view our archive of these conversations on our YouTube channel where we will upload today's conversation shortly. Uh, and our program is every day at 1 p.m. Um, so join us tomorrow for a conversation with filmmaker Rudy Valdez and rail editor at large, Reverend Dr. Donna Scopper on Valdez's feature documentary, The Sentence. We'll conclude with a reading of poems by Amiri Baraka by the rail's own Elizabeth Lothian. Um, so you now can all turn on your microphones to say hello, goodbye, happy new year, and thank you. So thank you all so much for joining. Right, thank you. I, I, I would just like to, ask um, if everyone's got the invitation to the pheasant and if they have all answered because there's been some uh, uh, problem some people didn't receive it and I assume that john susan mary mary joe and maria grazie have all got it and answered am i correct yes okay great thank you uh, please feel free to, to message me if anyone hasn't received that or uh, needs that link or information um yeah. But thank you, Luigi, and thank you, everyone, thank you. for joining today. It was a great thank pleasure. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank beautiful, you. beautiful. Thank thank you. You. Grazie, Grazie. Maria. Grazie. 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 Have a good day. Bye -bye. Grazie, everyone. Take care. Be oh. safe. Okay, you too. Thank you. We'll see you soon. Take care.